if I could see inside my father's wrist and measure the calcium, the fat, and the water, all without having to use a saw. <laughs> well, it turns out I can. We've developed a new X-ray microscope that lets us see inside solid objects. Our raw data elements are about the size of the thickness of a human hair. We measure eight X-ray colours, about 8,000 times as much data as standard CT technology. That is my wrist. That is my watch. What's your reaction when you first see it? Gross? Mine was great excitement. I think it's very beautiful. The image is very useful. I want, but I want to tell you a little bit about how we got here. This is actually the first so-called X-ray of a human hand from Wilhelm Röntgen nearly 125 years ago. It's his wife's hand, and he took this photo, if you want to call it that, within a few weeks of discovering X-rays. Called them X-rays because he didn't have a clue what they were. There's a ring on the hand, and that many of his contemporaries found this gross as well. In fact, even worse. Here was an image of a skeleton of a living person. We're used to it, but 130 years ago, no one had ever seen one before. Here's a technology, same technology basically, as the, the, that photographic plate on the left-hand side. The photographic plate is taken with chemicals. The X-rays have caused the image to be set up in the silver iodide of the photographic plate. On the right-hand side, we see more of the system. We see an X-ray source. We see the whole of the object being scanned, the detector, and a pattern recognition system. And that was a very standard way of looking at chest X-rays for nearly 70 years. That phosphor plate is something that's a scintillator. It glows when it's hit by X-rays or it glows when it's hit by ultraviolet. What we're doing is getting more information out of those X-rays. X-rays have colour. I'm using the word colour. We might use the word wavelength for e electromagnetic radiation. We may use frequency. We've got names for some of them. Radio waves, microwaves, infrared. We often talk about infrared light or visible light or ultraviolet light. And if we get further up that spectrum, we talk about our X-rays and gamma rays. The visible light has what I'll call visible colour, adapted by our eyes. The X-ray energy, I'll talk about X-ray colour. And when I'm doing about that, I'm talking about the energy per photon. Difficult thing, perhaps, the concept of what is light. Is it an a particle or is it a wave? It's actually both, and, and it's that property of having specific amounts of energy that's crucial for us seeing with our, light, with our eyes or us seeing what's happening to the inside of the body by looking at the X-ray signal that comes through. How are we managing to do that? Almost 100 years after seeing X-rays with photographic plates and with scintillators, CERN, the Centre European for Research Nuclear, developed some totally new detectors. It's by Lake Geneva, by Geneva Airport, but most of the land, most of that ring that you see on the screen is in France. There's a tunnel 27 kilometres long. It's actually my wife and the, one of the large detectors that I'm involved with. It's diagonally opposite the main central uh, offices of, of CERN. Um, out in the countryside of France. That detector that you see is just part of it, but it's part of a 12,500 tonne detector, or, or an experiment, if you like. It's got detectors of all kinds inside it, and I won't try and describe what a muon is or a solenoid is, but it's a huge detector with some large scintillating uh, crystals, some tiny of these new detectors. 
And the central part of that detector, and that's me in the left-hand corner of the picture, before it was put down the hole, while they were creating it on the surface, uh, the pixel barrel, as they call it, that has got these new detectors. These new detectors are semiconductor detectors, and therefore they are something that's only been able to be built in the last 30 or 40 years. It has been built by an enormous team. CERN has something like 10,000 workers, mostly at their home universities, occasionally go to CERN. A small group of those people developing those semiconductor detectors said we must take those pixel detectors, as we call, they called them then, and take them to medicine. And there's a huge group of people doing that, 23 universities setting out to develop new detectors. And the ones that we're using today are the Medipix 3 detectors. They are about the size of my thumbnail. They have 16,000 pixels, which is not very many compared to a cell phone. But unlike a cell phone, they've got 4,500 transistors per pixel. Your cell phone's got about one. And because they've got all of that very modern computer logic, in some ways they're as powerful as the chips in a computer, they can actually measure eight X-ray colors. Our eyes can measure three visible colors. Well, we've got three detectors, and it's a mixture of those that give you the, all of the other options. And so we can, instead of getting a black and white image, as Wilhelm got, we've got colour images. And this image here is actually of a baby's hand the size of my thumbnail. And what we've done is use that X-ray colour to say, where is the calcium? And we've shown that in blue, visible colour. And where is the, the rest of the flesh of the hand? And this is a very young baby, uh, and the bones of the fingers haven't been fully formed. So we can do things better than we can do 100, and, uh, 100, years, 100 years gap between those, 110 years gap between those two images. So what's the potential medical impact from this? Around 300 million X-ray CT scans are performed every year around the world. These are done for almost every medical condition, heart disease, stroke, car crashes, kidney disease, and cancer. Can we imagine a future where all of these are in colour? We started thinking about how we could examine this question. We built small animal and specimen scanners for medical schools. And this has allowed us to work with medical schools all around the world. We work with Christchurch, Melbourne, Mumbai, Moscow, Madrid, Massachusetts, and Middle America. And more recently, we built a human scanner that allows us to prove that what we can see on those small machines can be seen in living people. We, the first person we put in there was my father, and we managed to get some pretty pictures. But let's look at those small... <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at a mouse in one of those machines. This mouse contains fat, water and calcium. We've also added gold, gadolinium and iodine, common radiographic contrast used in hospitals and research labs. And if we strip the materials away, we can see that the iodine has gone to the kidneys and the bladder, the gadolinium is in the bowel and the gold is in the lungs. This has allowed us to start looking at diseases. This is an x-ray of someone's neck, the blood vessel that goes up to their brain. This person has a blockage in that uh, vessel. You can see that because the lumen is narrowed and there's probably some calcium there. Many of these people end up having to have an operation, have that pipe opened up. We've taken some of those surgical specimens and put them in our scanners. Using a Mars scanner, we can see the narrowing of the vessel, we can see the calcium, but in addition, we can see the wall, and in, in the wall we can see the changes in the tissue that are causing the disease, the necrotic fats that make this a person at risk for a stroke. We've worked with Oregon Health Sciences in the US to look at bone disease. We've taken human hips and put them in our scanner, and we've used it in two different ways simultaneously. We've done very high resolution imaging and color imaging at the same time. Using the high resolution, we can see the bone microstructure. But using the colour information as well, 
we can measure the calcium density, the mineralization of the bone. We can see the fats and we can see the water. So this will help us assess risk of fractures, but in addition, we can start looking at fracture healing. We can start looking at bone diseases such as cancers and osteoporosis. We've looked at arthritis. This is a picture of someone's knee. They've had their knee replacement, and the specimen from the operating theatre has come to our department. The other half of the knee that we've not shown, the cartilage is completely worn away. But this half of the knee has normal thickness of cartilage. But using our scanner, we're able to see the biochemical changes of osteoarthritis before there's physical changes. That means researchers can now start looking at the biochemical changes to develop new treatments and treat people earlier. Of course, with bones, often the surgeons want to put metal implants in, screws and plates and rods. These, unfortunately, make imaging very hard. In this example, on a standard CT, you get streaks and lines in the image. That's caused by the metal and the calcium having different X-ray colours. If we measure the X-ray colour, we can get rid of those artefacts, we can see the bone metal interface, so if someone goes to their doctor with an implant and it's hurting, the surgeon can look closely at that interface and say, there's an infection or there's loosening. We believe it will also be useful for cancer imaging. So in this case, we've taken clusters of breast cancer cells and grown them in a petri dish. We've then taken nanoprobes that attach to specific antigens. In this case, the HER2 antigen that shows us that that breast cancer cell line will be treatable with Herceptin. Our partners in Notre Dame have looked at breast cancer microcalcifications, another aspect of the same disease. These can be very hard to see on ordinary x-rays because they're tiny white dots. Using our scanner, we can see the calcium very clearly. I've shown it as blue, but their nanoprobe will identify those microcalcifications with absolute certainty. How this relates to, to the future, we can only imagine, but this means that people with cancer will have more personalised imaging and more personalised treatment. So this is my father's foot. This is a 3D rendering of the bones and the fat pad. We've made the, um, the tissues transparent. I find this quite interesting, but I prefer this view here. This is a cutaway view where I can see the microstructure inside the foot. I can also see the fat pad more clearly. And if we wait a few seconds, one of the things I find particularly cute with a family member is I can see the wrinkles in his skin. This data set alone is one and a half litre volume is 15 gigabytes of data, so extremely high resolution. This is our Christchurch-based team, well, half the Christchurch-based team. We went for a walk one day on the Port Hills. I put this up to show not only we're a multicultural team, but the team of experts doing this sort of research includes mathematicians, computer engineers, physicists, biochemists, pathologists, surgeons and radiologists. Truly an exciting group to be able to work with. So how do we take this to our community? Well, we believe we need point-of-care scanners. You'll be familiar with this type of approach if you go to the dentist and they do an X-ray before they do your, fix your filling. Or perhaps the pregnant woman going to see their obstetrician having an ultrasound in the clinic. We believe we can produce scanners for the surgeon who you go and see with your sore knee. You'll go to the clinic, they'll look at your knee, they'll assess it, physically, and then they can scan it and make a decision. Our technology is well suited to this technique. But if the scanner's at the, at the person, at the, at the patient, how do we get the expert diagnosis to them? One of the trends in medical imaging is to have teleradiology, to have your radiologists across the internet. And so that means we can provide the experts directly to the surgeons. More importantly, or in addition perhaps, it also allows us to bring in modern techniques for pattern recognition, such as artificial intelligence, to increase the accuracy and efficiency of these diagnoses. As I say, this is a beautiful image. We can see inside my watch. We can see the structure inside my hand. And we can't do that with other imaging technologies. 
So what else can we do? We've looked as a team at various geological samples, some volcanic rock, some other kinds of rock, seafloor uh, bores. We've looked at the problems that might face us in disease control, at, for example, in the New Zealand border, what diseases might be coming into the country. We've looked at the food industry in New Zealand with some of the people who are looking, how can you tell what is inside your sample of meat, in this case, or something else inside your, your fruit. And we've also looked with some teams, both in New Zealand and in the US, about how can we do better things for finding out what's inside, for example, a suitcase that flies. So what else can we do with this technology? How is it going to change our lives? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah,